welcome to the Christmas edition of the Good Graham Show. Um, yes, it's that time of the year again. Um, right, so how do you know it's the Christmas edition? Well, I'm surrounded by Christmas accoutrements. Um, baubles and, and the sparkly deer, <laughs> which comes out once a year. Um, basically, yeah, uh, it's probably a little bit early for the Christmas edition, but um, given the pressures of work this particular year, uh, I'm pretty certain this is going to be the last episode of the show that I'll get the opportunity to do before the new year. I mean, if I do manage to sort of squeeze another one in, it will probably be more down to luck and judgment, I imagine. Um, so, before we kick off, I'd just like to say a big, big thank you to everyone that's watched the show over the last 12 months. A uh, big thank you to you all for your support. Uh, also, a big thank you to all the suppliers, uh, distilleries, independent bottling companies, reps, what have you, that have contributed um, samples for uh, the last 12 months episodes. Obviously, without without you, the viewers, and um, the distilleries and uh, what have you, that, that wouldn't be a, a good dram show. And um, so, yeah, that's just a, a really big big thank you and uh, obviously uh, no, no intention of, uh, of stopping doing them so uh, next year we'll see probably some more interesting stuff I guess um, anyway so Christmas episode of the show um, historically um, it has been uh, devoted to should we say somewhat um, old and somewhat expensive whiskies um, although this year I am going to um, buck the trend shall we say and or go against convention as they might say and uh, we're looking at young whiskies and um, well why not I mean the thing is I mean yes old whiskies have their place and they have their their desirable attribute attributes um, so do younger whiskies and I'm always banging on about you know that the pleasures of youthful spirits sometimes they're a little bit too youthful but um, um, other times they're, uh, they're just absolutely spot on they have that lovely vibrancy and, and uh, yeah and, and a lot generally tend to have quite a fair amount of distillery character as you well know they tend that distillery character does tend to sort of uh, erode somewhat with the passage of time but Anyway, so that's not the only um, surprise about today's episode of the show. Uh, there are also four cherry finished whiskies in this week's episode of the show. You're probably thinking, ooh, um, but um, yeah, well, we'll obviously get to them in due course. Um, so anyway, what am I doing? Um, right, well, obviously, as you can see from the title page, uh, it's uh, it's Christmas with James Eady, and uh, why not? Um, I must say, since they contacted me, sort of contacted me this earlier this year, uh, I've been really impressed with uh, certainly their single cast bottlings, and um, you know, why not? I'm getting behind them. I mean, you know, uh, I think uh, I think that they're producing uh, bottling some lovely stuff, and um, you know, I think. Uh, with a bit of advertising is there and uh, um, well I guess that's probably about enough I mean I've spoken about James Eady when I did the uh, the episode not so long ago um, so not really a great deal else to say apart from um, let's have a look at today's one Searching for something Okay, so we're going to kick off with the Strath Mill. I'm guessing this is the sister cask of the uh, nine-year-old that was bottled earlier in the year, which was really, really good. Um, so this has now reached the venerable age of 10. Uh, it was distilled in 2008 and bottled this year. Uh, bottled at 59.3 from a recharged bourbon hogshead. Uh, the number is 806272. Next bottling we'll be looking at is a single cask or Kruisk. Uh, this was distilled in 2007, again bottled this year, uh, at 59.5%. So yes, we're doing the alcohol today. Um, so, first fill bourbon cask. I uh, don't know whether it was a barrel or a hoggy. Um, 805594. Now we're on to the sherry. That was a dramatic pause, by the way. Um, right, so no, these are not all... Well, they're sherry finished, um, so they're not 100% sherry matured. So we're going to kick off with a Linkwood. This is a 10-year-old uh, Linkwood bottled at 57.9%. Uh, percent. Uh, distilled in 2008, bottled this year. Uh, it's spent um, 
Well, um, most of its life in a refill bourbon cask, number one stroke one, and then 20, 20 months in uh, Oloroso. And, well, yeah, okay, it's got a reasonably dark colour, as dark as that one, um, and that spent less time in the in the cask. So it just goes to show you how, how sort of, you know, active some uh, sherry casks can be, or casks can be full stop. Um, so we'll see what that one's like. Um, the next uh, sherry cask finished we're looking at is this one. This is a Dal Ewan, uh, again 11 years old, uh, bottled at 54.3%. Uh, originally uh, matured in a refill bourbon hogshead 310570 and um, finished for six months in ex Pedro Zimenez. Yeah, actually, I'd expect that to be a bit darker, but anyway, well, we'll uh, we'll see what that one is like. And then we get we are going to get onto the dark one. This is a Glen Spey. Um, as you can probably guess, this was finished in a Pedro Zimenez cask, uh, six months in actual fact, and so. You know, it's it's surprising. Look, see how active a cask can be. Um, so the the Glen Spose distilled in two thousand and seven, again bottled this year. Um, originally uh, bought a uh, first fill, uh, refill bourbon hogshead eight o five four one o, and then like I said, six months in ex Pedro Zimenez casks. And Finally, the last one is a Colila. Uh, this is again 11 years old, bottled at 57.4%. Um, this was finished for six months in an ex um, Paolo Cotardo cask, which you don't really see very many of them. And Paolo Cotardo is quite an interesting, um, interesting sherry. And if memory serves me correct, I was going to check this before I started the show, but as per usual, I didn't. Um, if memory serves me correct, Paolo Gattardo is um, a, a, a fino where the floor that it's obviously maturing under, this is why finos don't have a huge amount of oxidative character because the dead yeast cells form a layer uh, over the uh, the spirit, which are, to a certain extent stops a lot of the oxidation. Um, and uh, so when that floor dies off, um, it then starts to mature like an Oloroso would, um, and hence a Paolo Gattardo tends to have sort of the body of an Oloroso with the sort of lightness and the aromas uh, of a Fino. So it's quite an interesting sherry in actual fact, and um, I quite like my sherries in actual fact, but I much prefer to have my sherries as sherries rather than, you know that. Don't you? Um, anyway, so you don't see too many of those sherry casks used, so that could be quite interesting, I think. Uh, so originally it was a, a refill bourbon hogshead, 314431, and then six months in ex um, Paolo Cotardo casks. So, so that's today's uh, lineup. Um, hmm, I think it's going to be quite quite fun. So uh, let's kick off with a bit of Strathmill then, shall we? Right, okay, so let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Quite rich, quite dense, nutty, very straw-like, um, but not in a mature kind of way, sort of uh, dried kind of barley, um, almost kind of barley husks, I suppose. Um, it's a little tight, um, but that's obviously because it's a car strength, and it's certainly doesn't quite have that sort of wonderful orange aromatic profile that the nine-year-old uh, from earlier in the year had. But there is a little bit of orange underneath and I just kind of get the feeling that, that putting a little drop of water with this will probably release those citrus notes because it does feel quite tight, quite sort of dry, um, straw-like. But it's got a lovely youthful freshness and... Um, Mmm, lots of barley at the moment. A little bit of, little bit of toffee, almost sort of vanilla-y toffee, just, just at the edges. Um, I mean, that is just a wonderful aromatic nose. Like I said, a little bit tight, um, but wonderfully aromatic nevertheless. Let's see what the palate's like. Again, it, quite, it mirrors the nose. It is a little bit tight. Again, the 
finish is quite masked by the alcohol. Um, nice spiciness though. Um, again, sort of slightly straw-like barley, uh, a touch of orange, a little bit of spice, which really kind of comes through nicely on the finish. The alcohol is kind of really bigging up those spices, so to speak. Um, juicy mouth-watering. Um, I mean, that is lovely. It's a lovely... Um, well, <laughs> not this kind of ABV and aperitif whiskey, it needs a little drop of water, um, which I have here and I will put a little drop with. Um, but I think, yeah, I love that, I love that youthful intensity. I think that's a, that again is another really very impressive cask. Anyway, let's see what a drop of water has done. Yes, it has sort of brought, it has, well, it has brought out the, the, the orange again. Not quite so exuberant and juicy as the, the nine-year-old. A little bit more oilier um, or waxier possibly. So it's got a more kind of orange skin kind of character as opposed to sort of like a, a juicy orange flesh kind of character. Um, again, straw-like barley. A little bit more oak, a little bit more toffee. Not quite so nutty, but it's in a little bit. It's still in the background. Got a coffee now. No, not coffee, tea, tea, tea leaves, touch of tea leaf. Um, hmm, so, uh, orange tea leaf kind of thing, you know, it's, it's an intriguing nose and this is, like I said, one of the wonderful things about young, young whiskies. A, they're not too expensive, I mean this is what, 47, 48 quid? Um, reason, <laughs> reasonably priced I think, and, and for its age, Plenty of complexity, plenty to love about it. Anyway, let's see what the power's like now. Mmm. That has opened up absolutely gorgeously. Lots of fruit now. Lots of orangey fruit. Touch of granulated sugar. Um, less spice. Um, but more sweetness, so it's a kind of like, how do you like your poison, so to speak. Um, very long, a little bit more simpler, but juicy and mm, really, really nice. So, yeah, hats off. I think uh, another another really good cask of, uh, of Stratton. Right, okay, so let's move on to the Akroisk. Uh, let's see what uh, the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Aromatic, actually. Um, aromatic, crisp, minerally, a lot of honey. Again, the alcohol is a little bit tight, not as tight as a Strath Mill, it has to be said. And um, um, even though it's 0.2% more, um, it's actually quite surprising how how they're differing. There's a lot more honey. Um, got a lovely density, a lovely richness. Um, but it's got a lovely minerality as well, sweet barley, and it's all being kind of nicely held in check by that uh, alcohol. I mean, Okroys can be a bit hit and miss at this sort of age. I've often found some of it to be a little bit too young and a little bit sort of um, over kind of uh, citric and sort of minerally and not an awful lot else. But this is actually quite quite dense. Um, by our Kreusk standards, it has to be said. Um, some lovely rich barley and like I said, honey, touch of earth. Again, it has a, a, a pleasant vibrancy to it and I, I think this is really quite, quite, quite nice. Um, let's see what the power's like. Generous, rich, oily, malty, lots of oak character. Um, well, first real bourbon, not a surprise really. Um, very rye-like herbal note on the finish. Um, so, but it's got a nice progression. It kind of, like I said, it kind of kicks off with a lovely sort of rich, malty, juicy, fruity character, and slowly in comes the oak, and the oak kind of like sort of builds quite nicely, and it gets. Um, 
sweet rye kind of notes, you know, almost kind of rye bread, dark rye bread on, on the finish. Um, as you know, I love my whiskies to have progression to tell me something about them, and I think that one certainly does. I don't feel it needs any water in actual fact, even though it is nearly 60%. It does seem to sort of like contain it pretty well, um, and it does give you a kind of like a, a slight mouth watering on, on the finish, but uh, we will see what, uh, what a little drop of water does to it. Ah, well, that's brought out the oak on the nose. Um, really vanilla, really toppied, um, gritty, um, again a sort of like a herbally rye kind of note. Not a huge amount of distillery character left now it has to be said on, on, on the nose. I mean yes there's, there's a little bit of barley beneath that but it's all it's all emphasizing the oak character. Um, which, to be, to be honest with you, is not a surprise. They, they often have a tendency to do that, um, first real American oak uh, bottlings. But, you know, I, I, I think sort of neat, personally I prefer the nose neat. And, uh, but, you know, even so, I think this is quite, uh, quite intriguing in an oaky kind of way. Anyway, let's see what the power's like. really the other way around in actual fact yes the oak is obviously noticeable but it's more vanilla now rather than that sort of uh, intense rye like note and it's got really juicy that the malt and the rye is uh, malt and the rye malt and the barley I should say is wonderfully juicy um, mouth filling um, succulent really full really long I mean you know for an 11 year old whiskey again it has a relative amount of complexity and um, I think I'd prefer the palate with a little drop of water in actual fact I think that's uh, that's really I can hear you crying Right, okay, so just in time to tackle the uh, the sherry monsters or not as the case may be the buddy cat arrives Hello, Barbie. Anyway, right, so we're now on to um, the Linkwood. Um, so this had um, 20 months finishing in ex Oloroso Castle. So let's see what, uh, what the nose is like. That's, that's very subtle on the sherry, it has to be said. Um, mm. So this is how I like my sherry. Subtle. Um, background, a little bit of dried fruit, but lots of barley, a bit of vanilla from the uh, from the American oak cask. Um, again, a touch of rye-like herbs mingling with the slightly herbally Oloroso notes. Um, a little bit of bubblegummy white fruit. Um, some lovely barley, fresh barley. I mean, you know, Linkwood is a lovely malt. It has to be said, and sometimes. It, there is a little bit too much of the uh, of the sherry, um, but you know I this is absolutely spot on in my my, my opinion. Um, I think they've left it for the right amount of time. Obviously, the the cask wasn't a particularly active um, sherry butt, and um, so although it seems to smell like it's probably only had about six months in there, uh, in reality it's had a lot longer because it's just taken that little bit longer to uh, uh, impart the character, which is. Which is good, um, isn't it, pretty cat? Anyway, let's see what power's like. Oh, it's a bit of a drying finish. It kind of kicks off with a lot more sherry character, uh, a lot more dry, tannic, woody, uh, oloroso, um, with some prunes and, and raisins and a little bit of walnut. But the American oak kind of sort of creeps in right on the finish. Again, a little bit of a rye likey kind of note, mingling in with the oloroso kind of rye note, dry, quite tannic, 
um, but still got a lovely juiciness to it, a lovely uh, barley character, even a little bit of white fruit just about comes through on the finish. Um, and yeah, again, I think that is really nicely balanced. It's possibly a little m more sherry than I would like on the palate, but um, even so, I still think that's um, really quite, uh, quite, yeah, quite impressive. Um, anyway, we're going to put a little drop of water with it and uh, see if that makes a great deal of difference. Anyway. Um, Well, that's lessened the sherry note. I mean, it was fairly subtle to start off with on the uh, on the nose, but I'm getting lots of that bubblegummy white fruit, um, peach, pear, apple blossom, barley. I mean, it's almost unsherried um, now on the nose. Lightly oiled, really quite quite floral and. Uh, um, very, very aromatic. Really nice. Palette. Gentler sherry, although the sherry is still quite dominant. It's a little bit, I wouldn't say homogenous, but it's a little bit less complex than it is neat. It's a little bit cinnamon kind of coming through now on the finish. It's kind of sort of obviously sort of dropped off the, the alcohol. Um, it's, it's a little bit more fleshier, oilier. Um, like I said, touch of cinnamon. It's, yeah, I, I like it. I think it's, I think it's really very, very nice. Um, and Maybe, I guess, without water is possibly, uh, I would favour it, but um, um, I certainly think that if you prefer a little bit more sherry character in your malt, then take that one neat, because it certainly sort of delivers that and it's got a little bit more of a punch to it. Um, but either way, I think that's, that's, that's impressive, certainly impressive enough to stick on the shelf, shall we say. So let's move on to the first of the two PX cast finishes. This is the uh, the Dal Ewan. Um, so let's see what the nose is like. Rich, grapey, definitely PX. Um, green nuts, treacle, a little bit of sort of treacle molassy kind of sort of notes. Um, Again, I think the alcohol is keeping that sweetness in it just in check. I mean, it's it is quite sweet, but the alcohol, like I said, is giving it a, a sort of a bit of a, um, a bit of a sort of like a balancing factor. Um, I mean, this was uh, it's got a nuttiness. I mean, Dalyuan tends to be sort of quite malty, quite nutty sort of spirit uh, anyway, and it's certainly certainly exhibiting that so there's definitely distillery character um, showing on the nose um, and again I think the balance is really just about right it's got just enough sherry character without overloading the um, the nose completely um, I mean you could probably argue that Dal Ewan has a bit of a, a bit more body than say something uh, like you know Glenn Spey for example um, and um, it can kind of like sort of withstand a little bit of sherry abuse, shall we say. Um, hmm. I mean, again, I like this. I think this is just about right, just about right on the balance. It's, it's, it's a bottle of that, um, 57.9. Um, yeah, I mean, it's got a sort of a fresh edge to it as well. It's, it's pleasant. Um, yeah, this could certainly sort of go well with your sort of Christmas pudding, one would imagine. Um, anyway. Let's see what powers on. Like the last one, a bit more 
of the sherry cask on the palate, juicy, pruney. Hang on, I'm getting a bit of almost peat smoke. No, it's not quite peat smoke. Wood smoke. Peat smoke? Mm. Oh, smoke. Mmm. That's a bit of kind of almost meatiness as well. That's that I wasn't expecting that one. Um yeah, it's kind of got a real kind of smoked meat finish. Wow, that's that's kind of thrown me a little bit. It has to be said, I don't remember that from the first time I tasted it. Um, it certainly opens up with, with plenty of the PX cask. You get the whiny, pruney, sort of treacly fruits. A little bit of maltiness, a little bit of barley kind of comes through, and then sort of suddenly out of nowhere, I'm just getting this kind of smoked meat kind of character. I'm sort of thinking, hello, is this really Dal Ewan? Um, or am I leche? You know, but um, green nut. Dried green nuts on the finish now, um, really pretty complex in actual fact, and uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I just kind of, I honestly don't, don't remember that meatiness uh, when I tasted it the first time around, and this is the wonderful thing about, about whiskey, you know, um, sometimes I do these episodes of the show and I've already tasted uh, the, the whiskies previously because I've obviously made a decision on whether I want to buy them or not, and um, different mood, different time of the day, normally I'm tasting in the evenings, you know, after I've had a meal, and you know, all these little things kind of add up, and, and sometimes, you know, your palate is maybe a little bit jaded, um, and when you come to it with a sort of like a, a fresh palate, I suppose, sometimes, you know, just flavours kind of just appear as if out of nowhere, and uh, certainly that this one was, uh, was a case in point. Um, Again, it's, it's still got plenty of that PX character, but it's a little bit softer, um, a little bit more floral in actual fact, a little bit more malty, whiny, nutty, um, a bit, bit more of a mineral freshness happening now, it has to be said now, put a little drop of water with it, and, um, you know, I, again, I kind of quite like this in a... Um, in a for, for a sherry finish, and, and I think the thing is that this is... I think finishing or sort of using a bit of sherry cask when you back them both together is it's the kind of stuff thing that I like because I don't dislike sherry, I don't hate sherry, but what I will well, bang on and on and on about is balance, you know, um, whether it's American oak or whether it's sherry cask, the last thing I just want is to sort of smell all of that and get and just say, well, could be any whiskey from any distillery, you know, what's what is the point in that? Um, but this has got yeah, buckets of character, you know. Um, really nice. Let's see what the palace like now. Still got that burnt meat character on the finish. Not burnt meat, smoked meat. Um, a little bit lessened. Uh, sherry wise but it's still got that sort of whiny treacly um px kind of characters a little bit more herbal notes kind of coming through now i'm getting a little bit more of the american oak as well um again kind of a sweet heathery um herbal kind of note uh quite malty again quite dense full hmm. you know i don't think that one's too bad at all Right, on to the real dark one now. So this is um, the Glen Spey, which, believe it or not, spent six months in PX cask. Looks like it spent six years in a PX cask in actual fact, but anyway, let's see what the nose gives us. Yep, that's a PX cask. Um, big, whiny, raisinated... Um, I mean, I kind of looked at at it on paper and thought, Glen Spey, Sherry, colour, distillery character, none. Um, yeah, and I was absolutely spot on. I mean, there is no Sherry, there's no Sherry character, no, and no distillery character. I mean, there are buckets of Sherry character. It's all PX, um, treacle, whiny, sort of pruney, Fruit. I mean, it's you know. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the poor old Glen Spade didn't stand a chance, really. At the end of the day, um, I mean, it's it's clean. I mean, and that is one thing I will say for all of these so far, all the sherry casks 
finished ones. Absolutely spotlessly clean, no blemishes, no sulphur. Um, so, although I chose not to uh, stock this particular one, if this sounds like it's up your uh, street, so to speak, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a stock somewhere. Um, anyway, let's see what the power's like. Again, big, pruny, whiny, juicy, PX. No character, no distillery character, it's just all cask. And, you know, I'm probably, you might think I'm just kind of dismissing it a little bit ad hoc. Um, but, like I said, the, the, the spirit could have come from anywhere at the end of the day. And certainly Glen Spey being one of those kind of lighter space eyed whiskies, um, once you sort of like, you know, lump sherry into it, or it into sherry, I should say, um, you are kind of dicing with... Pfft, no character whatsoever and you know like I said it's there are people that, that love this kind of whiskey but yeah for me it just leaves me a little bit cold and even though I'm going to put a little drop of water with it I really don't think that that's going to make an iota of difference to uh, to this particular whiskey so but then again I could be wrong <laughs> let's just see what the nose gives us now no I'm not wrong um it's got a little bit edgy I suppose a little bit youthful um yeah okay maybe i'm uh, there is a little bit more barley kind of character just sort of like underneath the surface but it's possibly because i'm kind of like looking for it i suppose but it's still predominantly sort of you know whiny px um sort of pass like that No, not really much change at all in actual fact. Um, it's very soft, it's slightly homogenous. Um, again, it's all very, very sherried and um, herbal, heathery, you know. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, you know, looking at the colour, you just know pretty much straight off the bat what you're going to get and it gives you what, you, what you'd expect. So, um, but anyway, so uh, let's, uh, let's move on. So... Right, okay, so let's move on to the 11 year old Coalila in the Palo Cotado. Let's see what they give us on this. That is, that's lovely. Um, quite peated for, for a Coalila, I mean, but then again, I mean, as we know, Coalila can be anything from zero to um, quite a large amount of peat, but uh, um, this is quite at, the, quite at the peated end of the spectrum for Coalila. Um, fresh, crisp, wood smoke. No, peat smoke, not wood smoke, peat smoke. Um, touch of coal dust and, and a little bit of lightly nutty sherry. Um, and I mean really delicately sherried. I mean, um, this is pretty much more about the the, the, the spirit rather than the um, rather than the sherry. But and it's only just delicate. It's kind of in the background. It's like maybe sniff and you might miss it. You know, you kind of have to almost look for it um and um yeah i like that i mean it, the longer it stays in the glass in actual fact and a little bit more aeration you give it the, the sherry notes do start to sort of come forward a little bit but but it's got a lovely kind of body to it it's like i said it's, it's quite quite salty moderately salty quite crisp fresh um not quite old school coolie because there is a bit of weight to it and a little bit of oiliness but um and a, a lovely nuttiness just just kind of sitting in the background with a little bit of dried fruit um that is absolutely gorgeous so we'll pass on now That's a lovely chewy finish. 
So it kind of kicks off quite sweet, quite barleyed. Um, again, there's that sort of subtle nutty sherry note. Um, dried peat. Um, yes. Slightly medicinal note. Um, peat smoke. A lot of peat smoke on the finish. Uh, and a real crisp sort of saltiness. Um, oh, that is, that's good. I mean that's got a lovely intensity, and Colita is is one of those one of those whiskies that really you can get away with bottling it practically at well <laughs> practically three years old. And I mean I've tasted plenty of young Colila, and um, it's just got that wonderful vibrancy, and um, the sherry is just really nuanced and balanced. And um, before you start emailing me to say can I buy a bottle, I've sold them all. I mean. And James Eady has sold all of theirs as well, so yeah, I mean, have a look around, you might find it online, but um, mm, that is absolutely fantastic. I really, really like that one. It's just got a, a, a lovely balance. Um, I will put a little drop of water with it, although, again, the alcohol is pretty well contained and I don't think it actually needs it per se. Uh, in actual fact, the, the elevated alcohol just kind of adds to that kind of salty sort of freshness. Um, so, um, so yeah, let's uh, see what those good as now then, shall we? Slightly emphasised the, the, the sweeter sherry notes in actual fact, um, but it's also emphasising the barley. The peat has kind of dropped off a little bit, as I would have expected. Uh, it's quite malty, it's robust. Um, it's more modern Kulila in style now than um, having that sort of fresh kind of crisp citric edge. Um, Slightly smoky, yeah, slightly smoky. Um, absolutely gorgeous. Let's see what the palace are now. Again, slightly sweeter, more barley, a little bit more nutty sherry. Um, Still got that lovely sort of peat coal dust kind of finish. Um, quite robust and full now. Um, less of the saltiness, less of the, the crisp citric freshness, but still really mad filling and um, absolutely delicious. Right, okay, so not a lot of time left on the clock, so I better wrap this one up fairly quickly. Um, right, so first off, a big thank you to Hugh at uh, James Eady for the samples for today's episode of the show. I um, hope I've uh, done them justice, so to speak. Um, so, quickly through them, Strath Mill, yeah, really nice. Um, maybe not quite as juicy as the nine-year-old, but certainly had plenty of orange and certainly was really nice once you put a little drop of water with it and made it a little less tight. Um, the Akroisk, um, don't think it really needed any water at all, um, uh, really kind of, uh, really nice for a young Akroisk, sort of lots of kind of fruit and character, so can't argue with that one. Um, the Linkwood, um, really nicely balanced, very, very good, uh, excuse me, um, the link would sort of repeating on me, or maybe it's the cool leader. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, really balanced, really nice, and certainly, you know, if you like um, balanced sherry matured or sherry finished whiskey, certainly um, the link would, would be up your street. Um, the Dal Ewan, again, I mean, a little bit heavier on the sherry, but um, the, the malt itself had that sort of like, you know, quite malty, heavy, kind of weighty kind of character. And it really kind of stood up to it quite nicely. And again, it's certainly one that I would quite happily uh, recommend because I thought that was really very, very good. Um, the Glen Spay, well, yeah, it's, it's, it is a sherry monster. Uh, I mean, that cask was, was way, way too active. You could have probably have just a done that for three months and it would have been absolutely fine but that's the thing about finishing it's an imprecise science you never quite know you probably thought well six months will be fine we'll go and check it after six months and then you think oh ah mm, better get that one bottled and the coal dealer. um yeah well obviously i think the star of the show it has to be said really nicely balanced love the use of paolo Cotardo casks um a lighter sweeter um character shall we say emphasizing the barley a lovely nuttiness as well 
Um, yeah, I, I like that. I like the use of Fino casks, and I like the use of Palo Cotado casks, and the occasional Manzanilla one. You very rarely, again, you very rarely see those casks used. It's normally all about the bloody Oloroso, and they're all big and, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, so, yeah, really nice to see uh, something slightly different. And, like I said, unfortunately I've sold all my bottles of it. I mean, it was just, just one of those things. I'm sure that out and about there, if you do uh, do a search, um, or you can email um, James Eden, I'm sure they'll tell you who had the, the lion's share of the allocation, shall we say. Um, and that was, the, that was the point. I mean, it was all allocated out, and I, I basically, you know, got six bottles, and it was a case of, well, I had to commit to it, before I tasted it, but then when I tasted it, I said, yep, I'll have them, but obviously there were no more left after that. But anyway, um, that's that's life in the whiskey trade, as they say. So anyway, like I said uh, at the beginning of the show, a big, big thank you to everyone that's watched the show this year. Really hope you've enjoyed it, and um, I seem to have mm, no whiskey left. So I will bid you a Merry Christmas. I hope... Uh, Santa brings you, uh, um, fills your stocking with good whiskey, and if you're obviously going to pay a visit to the shop, um, say hi, say you watch the show, um, you won't get a discount, but just say hi anyway, but anyway, so that's, that's, that's it, see you next year.